Our opening hymn is 212, hymn 212.
follow the order of service as found on page five. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we plead for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who hast given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee, and of thy will, and through obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, hath had mercy upon us, and hath given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgiveth us all our sins. To them that believe on his name he giveth power to become the sons of God, and hath promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Please turn to Psalm 19. It's on page 858 of your pew Bibles. We read together Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises up in one and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eye. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Glory be to the Father.
chapter beginning with the 25th verse. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So far, the Old Testament lesson. Mother's Day in the church community. Mother's Day holds a profound significance in the church community. It serves as a time to recognize and appreciate the nurturing and selfless love that mirrors God's unconditional love for us. It is an occasion to honor not only biological mothers, but also spiritual mothers, grandmothers, aunts, teachers, mentors, and all women who have made a positive impact on nurturing and shaping lives. Mother's Day also provides an opportunity to reflect on the biblical principles of motherhood. Through scriptures and reflections, we can explore the divine attributes of motherhood, such as compassion, gentleness, sacrifice, and wisdom. Moreover, it is a day to extend support and reach out to those who may find Mother's Day challenging due to the loss of a mother, infidelity, or other personal circumstances. It is a time for the congregation to come together and express gratitude for the love and care that mothers provide.
reinforce the biblical principles and examples of motherhood, highlighting the strength and virtues of mothers. Proverbs 31, 25 through 31. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise and give instructions with kindness. Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and mother, then you will live a long life. Fulfill life in the land of your fulfill life in the land of Lord of the Lord your God has given to you. Isaiah 66. As a mother comforts her children, so I will comfort you, and you will be comfort, comfort over Jerusalem. Psalm 139, verse 13, 14. You created my inmost being. You kept me together in my, womb, my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. The Christian mother. Sometimes we take for granted the Christian mother who is there. The mother who has raised us, who gave her love and care. The mother who helped us grow in a fine Christian home. The mother who has taught us with God we're not alone. The mother who has laughed with us when all was going well. The mother who has picked us up the times that we have failed. The mother we didn't appreciate until we were fully grown. The sacrifices she made for us as time quickly moved along. The mother with such Christian faith that helped us from the start. The mother who we love and cherish and treasure in our hearts. Someone who can brush a tear from the downy cheek of a newborn 
and gauge a child's temperature without the aid of a thermometer. I need someone who has a special neck for soothing, who can kiss away pain and soften blows. Someone who will hold her child's hand firmly until she has to release it, cheerfully, on the first day of school. And so, God made a mother. I need someone who will care enough to gather daffodils and put them in a vase so everyone in the house can enjoy the first blooms of spring. Someone who will care enough to rummage through the mismatched sock pile in hopes of finding a match. Someone who will make birthdays extra special, sing silly songs with her toddlers in the car, and who actually wants to go on a school field trip to the insect museum just to be close to her child. God thought, I need someone who will play Christmas carols on the piano, someone who will decorate gingerbread houses with the kids and wrap gifts and deck the halls for Christmas, for nothing in all my creation will be able to make Christmas as special as a mother will. And so, God made a mother. I'll make someone who can gather a chaotic, busy family around the dinner table for chicken soup, cornbread, and sharing life together. Someone who will organize play dates, piano lessons, and the pantry. I need someone who can find the lost football team, dad's keys, and bun bun, her little girl's favorite stuffed bun. I need someone who can unload the dishwasher, pack lunches, call out spelling words, and make coffee, all while bouncing a baby on her hip. Someone who will carry an amazing array of toys, snacks, and essentials in her already heavy purse, and never complain. I need someone to help with endless school projects, organize the football banquet, and say, I'm so proud of you, even when her child fails. It must be someone who is willing to keep going, even when she thinks she has no strength left. Someone who will strive to love her kids and to love their father even more. I need someone who's willing to work the second shift, or take second best, or play second fiddle so that her family will have it better than she did. And so, God made a mother. I need someone who believes, someone who will trust that I have a good plan for her and for her children, even when she can't see it. Someone who will pray for her family daily, for sadly, few people will. I need someone who will share my words and encourage her children to believe in me because I am the source of life. God said, I'll place a second pair of eyes in the back of a mother's head, give her bionic ears, and grant her a generous portion of laughter and tears, for she will need them. Sometimes she'll feel like she doesn't have what it takes. There will be days when she's overcome with worry, pain, or failure. But when the need arises, she'll be there. And while motherhood will be difficult, she'll come to embrace it with all of her heart. Yes, this is exactly what I need. To put it simply, I need someone who will love my children like, well, kind of like I do, God laughed. And so I'll give each mother the heart the size of Texas, and if she'll let me, I'll fill it with my special forever kind of love, a love that resembles my own. Once I put a precious baby in her arms, she will never be the same. One day her children will grow up and move on, but she never will. As long as she lives, she will fight for her children, pray for them, and sacrifice for them.
reminded by what you did that I normally include a special reading for Mother's Day that I neglected to include, so I will include that now. It's the Proverbs reference in chapter 31. A wife of noble character who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with her eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand she holds a distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed with fine, in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So far, the reading. Our epistle lesson for today is found in Peter's first epistle, the fourth chapter, beginning in the middle of the seventh verse. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sin. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as the one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God reigns over the heathen. God sits on the throne of his holiness. Hallelujah. I will not leave you comfortless. I go and I will come again to you, and your heart shall rejoice. Hallelujah. gospel is written in the 15th chapter of St. John, beginning with the 26th verse. Glory and once again, the reading is from that time when Jesus with the disciples in the upper room, sometime during the Passover meal, probably near the end of it, before they went to Gethsemane, and he's speaking to them to comfort them. He says, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is, is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this, so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first, because I was with you. Here ends the Gospel. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed as found on page 12. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with him 508. church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manion, who had been brought up with, the, with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. 
There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus, who was an attendant and the pro of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to go blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. This is our text. Dear fellow reading, Thursday was Ascension Day, so this is the Sunday after the Ascension. That's why it's called the Sunday after the Ascension. Others may prefer to call this the last Sunday of the Easter season, for next Sunday is indeed Pentecost. Both Easter and the Ascension call attention to the victory of Christ won for us. Without Easter, without the resurrection of Jesus, there is no Christianity. It was the risen, victorious Jesus who ascended into heaven. Jesus is now at the right hand of God, meaning he's in a position of authority ruling over all creation for the benefit of his people, for you and me. Using his authority, after all, he's at the right hand of God, Jesus told his followers, that includes you and me, to preach the gospel. The lessons today anticipate Pentecost. On Pentecost, we look at the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, with the power of the gospel, creates faith in the hearts of people. And then he continues to work on those hearts by giving them increased understanding and keeping them in the Christian faith. On that first Pentecost, the Holy Spirit added about 3,000 souls to the kingdom of God. When we look at the Ascension account, the disciples were still thinking of the kingdom of God as something like the earthly kingdoms of David and Solomon. Jesus redirected their thinking by telling them that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem and then throughout the world. On that first Pentecost, then we hear those disciples, now apostles, preach the crucified and risen Christ. And from Pentecost on, they continued to preach that same message. As the apostles preach Christ, they also experienced opposition to their proclaiming of that message. The Jewish leaders at that time were especially uh, emphatic in their disapproval of what the apostles were preaching. And this opposition grew stronger and stronger. There came a point when a man named Stephen was put to death by stoning for his continued testimony regarding Christ. And at the stoning of Stephen, there was a man there by the name of Saul who gave his approval to what was being done. And Saul continued to persecute the church and arrest Christians. And then one day when Saul was on his way to Damascus to arrest more Christians, Jesus stepped in and let Saul know that he was wrong. They had to lead him the rest of the journey into Damascus for three days he ate or drank nothing, and then the Lord sent a man by the name of Ananias to help Saul transition from what he was to the missionary that he became. 
Our text picks up the story of Saul sometime later, in fact, at least three years later. Saul now is a member at the church in Antioch, one of its teachers. On one occasion when the leaders were worshiping, the Holy Spirit set apart Saul and Barnabas for mission work. And as we follow the story, we see the Holy Spirit sent them on their way, that Saul and Barnabas proclaimed the word of God in synagogues, and the Holy Spirit led Paul to give blindness to the sorcerer named Elimus. What we see in all of this history are three things. The Holy Spirit directing the church, God's people doing what they were told to do, proclaiming the word of God, and we see continued opposition to the message of Christ. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And here we get a glimpse of how things were done in the early church. The leaders gathered together on occasion to worship and fast. And with fasting is often connected then meditation or study of God's word and prayer. By skipping a meal and the time to prepare it, that time was used instead for meditation and prayer. Several times a year I attend a pastor conference and it's something quite similar. We gather for worship, we gather to study God's word, we do some praying. There's one minor difference though. They fasted, we often eat quite well at conference. I have written a number of papers over the years for, for the fellow members attending the conference. My goal was to do some study in such a way that I would be able to write something that would be of benefit to my fellow pastors. And if a member asked about it, I wrote it in such a way that I hoped they would benefit as well. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. In some way that's not fully explained here, the Holy Spirit in some way spoke to these leaders as they were gathered together and told them to set apart Saul and Barnabas. We don't need to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how this was done because we're not told anyway. What is clear is that the Holy Spirit is indeed directing the work of his people. The Holy Spirit was telling the congregation of Antioch to set apart Saul and Barnabas. Today we would call, say, call Saul and Barnabas. What you see happening here then is the calling process that we use today, and it has both a divine portion to it as well as a human portion to the whole process. A little over 32 years ago, Zohar was without a pastor. The human process of calling a pastor involves Zohar working together with Paul the Apostle to set up a working relationship between the two congregations as a dual parish. And after months of, of uh, committee work, if you will, finally there was a working together agreement that was produced. And then came the calling process. It happened in December of 91. I can remember it somewhat well. It took place in the basement at Paul the Apostle. I was the vacancy pastor there, along with Pastor Herman, and so I opened the meeting with a devotion. The district president had a list of six names that he read, and I'm listening to that and thinking, man, there's some really good people on this list. When he was done, 
someone asked if a nomination could be put in from the floor. And the president said, yes, and my name was put in. Immediately, the district president asked if that was okay with everybody involved, and it was, and so now I had to leave the meeting so they could discuss the names freely. I uh, was surprised at the end of the meeting when someone came and let me know that I had received a call. Even though I wasn't looking for it, now I had to deliberate on whether or not to accept the call. This is all part of the human process of calling. Add to this the work of the Holy Spirit, who worked through the called leaders of each congregation to call a pastor or a teacher. I received the call. My first thought was not to accept the call. But over time, the Holy Spirit changed my thinking, and I accepted it. The Holy Spirit led the church in Antioch to call Saul and Barnabas. The Holy Spirit gave Zohar and Paul the Apostle, me, to serve you. God is someone who is still in control. He still rules. God rules. In, ruling includes more than just the calling process. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Two of them, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. The leaders at Antioch didn't just call Saul and Barnabas, prayed for them, they placed their hands on them. They prayed because they were exercising their faith in Christ and, and, and wanted the, God to help these two men then to do the work that they were called and sent to do. They placed their hands on them, an outward gesture. You saw something similar when I was installed. An outward gesture that, that symbolizes the giving of the Holy Spirit to equip the called person, whether it's pastor, teacher, or missionary, to equip him, to enable him to do the work that he was called to do. Recall that first Pentecost. These were a bunch of average ordinary people who followed Jesus for three years, called disciples. Some were fishermen. No special training in other languages. But on that first Pentecost, the Holy Spirit enabled them to speak in other known languages in order to communicate the word of God and the message of Christ. God rules by equipping his people to serve him. Luke tells us that Saul and Barnabas went into the synagogues. That shouldn't surprise us. The synagogue was a place where the Jewish people gathered together to around God's word. You would expect people in synagogues to be looking for the Messiah to come. And Saul and Barnabas had the privilege then of telling these people that <coughs> the promise that God made on the pages of our Old Testament was finally kept in the person of Jesus. And the faithful Jew was more than glad to hear this good news. Luke simply tells us they proclaim the word of God. But as we look at the book of Acts and, and, and the epistles in the New Testament, we get a good glimpse of the preaching. For example, Paul said in Romans, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In other words, Paul and Silas were preaching sin and grace. Look at the Pentecost message that Peter delivered in Acts chapter 2. He preached Christ crucified and risen again. It is that message on the page of Scripture that makes us wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Saul and Barnabas were called and set apart. They went and proclaimed the word of God. And yes, they also endured opposition. To the preaching uh, of, of the word that there was opposition 
And so we read, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. Then they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Saul and Barnabas went about their duties throughout the entire island, finally came to a place where there was a Roman official called a proconsul. We see that the message they were delivering even ended up in high places in high, of, of government as well. There were people willing to listen to Paul and, and, and Barnabas. We also meet a false prophet by the name of Bar-Jesus, also known as Elements. Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew name in Joshua. He was a sorcerer, meaning he is doing some sort of magic. Not all magic is bad. But since Elymas was a false prophet, I'm guessing that some of his sorcery involved demonic powers. And that would explain why he was so opposed to Saul and Barnabas. But as we see, the Holy Spirit still rules. And so we read, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately a mist and darkness came over him, and he was groping about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Our bulletin cover points to a passage from the high priestly prayer that Jesus prayed on Monday, Thursday. He prays that, that uh, God would protect us from the devil and his fellow men. Here in our story, the Holy Spirit puts an end to the trickery of Elymas. The Holy Spirit caused Elymas to become blind. Notice it said for a time. God intended the temporary blindness to, to give Elymas time to Think about what he had been doing and the message of Paul and Barnabas. Give him time to repent, if you will. And just as an aside, here's the first time that Saul is actually called Paul. And I will say it again, God still rules. He blessed the preaching of Paul and Barnabas. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. God has throughout the centuries blessed the preaching of his word, does so still today. If you think about it, with those small beginnings in Jerusalem and the surrounding territory, now here we are, halfway around the world from there, and we're still talking about Jesus. And even though the miracles recorded in the New Testament occurred nearly 2,000 years ago. They still save the same purpose today. They encourage us to pay attention, to listen to the word of God. Is it any less wonderful today that Elymas was struck blind for a time than it was 2,000 years ago when it happened? No, it's still amazing. God still rules. May the Holy Spirit then continue to rule in your heart and mind today and always. Amen. Peace of God which surpasses all our understanding shall so keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
invite you now to sing our offering hymn, hymn 438, verses 4 and 5. to the right hand of God. We thank and praise you for opening the kingdom of heaven to us undeserving sinners and for calling us into that kingdom by giving us faith and trust you as our Lord and Savior. What joy is ours as members of your kingdom, ruled by your mercy and no longer filled with fear. We are confident of our salvation. No longer ruled by Satan and sin, we are empowered by your love to do the good works to which we have been created and now are called. We pray that, having made us members of your kingdom of grace, you would keep us in the true faith until the end, that we might be partakers with you of the kingdom of glory. Give us a hunger for your word and nourish us by it. Cause us to daily remember our baptism, which has washed away our sins. Make us frequent guests at the Holy Supper of your body and blood, received in communion with bread and wine, that we might show forth your death till you come and trust in it for the forgiveness of our sins. Help us to seek first the kingdom of heaven and your righteousness and to put your word, our faith, forgiveness of sins, and the hope of salvation first in our lives. Dearest Jesus, we also pray that you will have your kingdom come to others by multiplying the preaching of your gospel in the world. Cause sinners everywhere to accept you and your faithfulness by grace. Help us overcome our sinful flesh and thus make us able ambassadors of your kingdom. Encourage us to support the cause of Christian missions generously with our gifts and to remember our pastors and missionaries daily in our prayers. Bless your kingdom workers everywhere. They labor and grant them the joy of seeing the fruits of their labors. Give the word they preach free course that your elect may be drawn from the far corners of the world. Our ascended Savior, hear our prayers and bestow on us the help and the relief we require. Comfort us with the forgiveness and crown our lives with good. Aid us against every temptation and strengthen us in every trial until we receive the victor's wreath of everlasting life. Help our pastors to preach and our teachers to teach and our people young and old to receive the word with joy. Hear us for the honor of your name as we join in the prayer that you taught us. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with hymn 505 from Christian Worship. And I picked this hymn because it's a hymn that deals with family life, and since today is Mother's Day, family life is certainly on our agenda. Hymn 505.
that every course it be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Ghost, one true God, now and forever. and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee, be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 342 332, I'm sorry in Christian worship. Boy, I'm tongue-tied today. Hymn 332. <laughs> 